Welcome back to the season finale of season two for the CPTSD podcast. We are going to talk about something that we have been chuckling about over the course of the last few episodes. So you've decided to go home for the holidays. Uh, so if we laugh too much or we're having a good time, we're not making fun. It's just, uh, um, it's, it's funny. It'll be all right. We'll see you inside. Welcome back to the CPTSD podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am here with Beth Pace, who is going to be recording her last episode of the CPTSD podcast for now. Um, and so just to, wanted to take a minute, Beth, and offer gratitude for all the work and effort that you have put into this and wish you the best in saying no in November and moving forward and however you're going to take your huge toolbox and help the world. Today Thanks, we're Beth. talking, you're welcome. I'm sorry, just kept on going there, Beth. Um, yeah. today. Well, I just wanna to say to everybody that's ever listened or shared a comment or left a comment on YouTube about how this has helped you, um, I'm so grateful. It's been so touching because we know um, you know, Tabitha and I both know how lonely it can feel um, to really believe that other people have got life figured out and somehow like you're the only one who's missing something. And so if this podcast has ever shown just a little bit of light into that, that you're not alone and that healing is possible, um, that's all we ever wanted. So um, it's been my, my true pleasure to be able to be of service in that way. All right, let's take away. Let's take it away. This Let's this take it away. All right. Topic. So a lot of us who have experienced CPTSD and are awakening or awakened to the fact that our family may have had a really large role. If your CPTSD stems from developmental, tra excuse me, trauma, then you, this is part of, it feels like your core, your family, what to do with it. And, you know, this goes beyond, I just want to set the bar a little bit, Beth, that this goes beyond typical, I don't want to talk about politics mm -hmm. or I, you know, or it's just boring when I go home to be with my family. This is when you go home to your family of origin or whoever your caregivers were, and it is harmful to you. And it is intended to be that way because it keeps us within the relationship the same way. So that homeostasis, that staying the same, it keeps the roles the same. It keeps the experiences the same. And it's going to keep your hurt and frustration the same. If you're realizing that this is something you may or may not want in your life now, this holiday season or moving forward, this is the episode for you. So Beth, we talked a little bit about starting off with, okay, you've decided to go home. Yes. So I'd be interested, Beth, to hear from you. What's like the first thing you want to unpack from that idea of deciding to go home? Yeah, um, I just want to also, um, you know, float by that there are different flavors to this kind of intergenerational trauma. So there are those caregivers that are um, consciously or unconsciously, they have a really vested interest in keeping you uh, in that relationship. And then there are the ones who um, are so dissociated or they are so unconscious of who they are, how they act and what they're like. If you looked at them and you were like, did you know you're hurting me? Like if you could get them in this honest moment and they would go, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. So I think there's, there's the, like, there are different flavors of this, which is one of the reasons that I think that this whole holiday thing can get really confusing in the cases of some parents. It is about manipulation. Oh, so you're not going to come see your aging sick dead. Wow. You know, who do you think? And then there's the ones where it's like, we just love you so much. And we just want you to feel God's love on this holiday. And like you, the sincerity I believe is authentic and it's still dangerous. Like it's right. both, which is why your nervous system is doing all manner of stuff. So the thing I want to start with related to the unpacking is, um, whose expectations are you meeting? Yes, and please. Are you reacting to someone else or are you taking the action that you would actually like to take? Perfect place to start. Let's yeah. go. Yeah. 
So expectations, um, if someone, ha- if you are part of a family script, and this could be culturally more broadly than just your family culture, that you are supposed to feel a certain way during the holidays, that you are supposed to act a certain way during the holidays, and that you are supposed to um, play a role, even if it's like, that, that's just what everybody does. You just have to pay the price. You pay the piper. This is what everybody does. And like, let let us be not the first, but maybe the loudest voice in your ear. You don't have to do anything you don't want to. You're grown up. All right. Tab's just nodding her head. Like for those of you who are just listening, we're both just like, look, we're just like nodding our head being like, you don't have to do anything you don't want to anymore. And we've right. said in past, past episodes about this idea of just choosing a different kind of pain. If it's going to be painful either way, maybe try something you've never done before. See how it goes. Just train your nervous system. Um, I said expectations. What was the other thing I said, Tab? So Beth, the other one was, are we reacting to the situation or are we making choices and taking actions and responding to the situation? So yes. both of those are key. Absolutely key. And for a lot of us, especially with the developmental trauma crowd, we have interjected or absorbed the expectations. And so sometimes we might not even know if we're choosing or reacting. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear what you think about that idea. I think that it's, um, it's so confusing in the beginning. It's so confusing in the beginning. So uh, the recording date for this podcast is November 12th. By the time you're hearing it, you may have already made decisions about what you're going to do this winter, this fall. And so um, let's let, if you have chosen to go home for the holidays, or if you've chosen to be with some family members, uh, let's let this year be the discovery year. Yes. Does it ever work? Is doing, is giving someone what they want, is giving this family member what they want? Has it ever satisfied them? Have they ever then turned around and been like, I'm proud of you? (laughs) Or been like, I, you know, like, or have you guys ever had that deep conversation you wanted to? So suffice it to say, like, it is so confusing. So no matter where you are on your trauma recovery journey, if you've decided to go home for the holidays, let this year be about exploring and getting information, not judging yourself, not being hard on yourself, but not dissociating to a level where you're like, that wasn't so bad. And then all of January and February, you're comatose and totally depressed because of how much energy it cost you to do things in like November and December. Mm-hmm. And I, I absolutely love what you're saying. I think that the idea of going into that observer mode like be a detective Mm -hmm. and notice more than you think you might have originally noticed that takes effort. So I just want to drop in a little pro tip. If you get triggered and you feel all those reactions in your body that we've been talking about over both seasons, that would be an indicator to take a break, Mm -hmm. kind of come back into yourself, regulate your nervous system as much as you can. And then process what just happened and decide how you want to interact with it. And that interaction can be a broad range of things from leaving permanently going home to trying to re-engage and see if the, if you misunderstood something. So my point was regulate yourself as much as you can when you feel that distress coming up and it will help you stay in observer mode. Yeah. Um, another addition to that, I'm so glad you brought it up. Um, If that inner child part of you is like screaming or, you know, you've started interacting with like um, those more vulnerable parts of you and they're seeming to you to feel very betrayed, like, oh, wow, I messed it up again. Here I am knowing I shouldn't have come home, but here I am home. You can like, it's actually okay to look at your own self and go, okay, I I messed up because I didn't listen but I will do as best as I can right now to take care of you. I am listening to you. And like, this is going to end. That was one of the things that as a child, whatever the circumstances were that um, like frozen in time aspect of it, this is never ending. Um, That's not true in present day, but in a lot of ways, it's really just about how you talk to yourself. So if we're just a couple minutes in, I want to not pivot, but like, let's carve a little time out. Someone sent us an email a while ago, which was like, 
But what about for those of us who have decided to go no contact, who don't go visit, who don't contact, and we just want to shout out to you and like validate you. So for those people who have not chosen to go home for the holidays or who have, who have chosen to go no contact, what are some of your like words of support tab? For people who have chosen to go no contact, I would say stay the course with that. If yeah. you feel improved since going no contact, you made the right choice and don't let culture or guilt or shame strong arm you into yeah. doing something that is hurtful. And before we keep going with that, because I have hours, I could talk about that. Yeah. Right. I just want to pop back in and say, Beth, you're right, that people may have made decisions about what they're going to do for the holidays before yeah. we release this podcast. But I want to pause and say, even if that has happened, you can change your plans. So if that inner child that Beth was just talking about is like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. Please listen. Mm -hmm. And there are, you can modify what you do from canceling to deciding I'm going to stay at a hotel mm -hmm. instead of in my parents' house. It is okay to change your plans. I just wanted to drop that. So yeah. where would you like to tap back into the no contact piece or what are you thinking? Yeah, let's just uh, let's just validate all those people who like if you're uncertain about your decision to go no contact or you just need a little validation, like, you know, we want to we want to make that space too. like maybe you don't celebrate the holidays and you know what, you don't have to or like there are a lot of things that um, th I think there's a little like. I just want to make sure that there's not this kind of like um, American cultural like expectation where there's this other piece of it that I want to carve out where like there are people who don't speak to their families because that is the that is the for the healthiest um, for their highest health and healing and for their family's highest health and healing and there are people who don't celebrate the same holidays as everybody else and there's like what is everybody else? Like how you want to spend your winter is your own business. What I wanted mm -hmm. to say is what, you know, to just second one more time, what Tabitha just said, if you feel peace in the present, because you are not interacting with this family, these biological, you know, family members, then you've got a sense in your body that you're doing the right thing. And if what feels bad is grief, but grief, but the, the effort to avoid the grief is what is leading you back into toxic circumstances. My invitation spend winter, like at least in my own, like European ancestry, spend winter in, uh, in the cabin of your mind, resting and nesting and like eating root vegetables and drinking warm liquids and just like letting there be this time to, to rest and be still instead of forcing yourself to do things because you think that's how you're going to get away from this grief. Absolutely. And add sleep to that list that Beth yeah. just gave, because sleep is one of the most healing activities that you can do. And it really um, is free. Mm -hmm. Now, free. just the caveat, you know, sometimes we oversleep. So just be mindful of that. But if you're tired, sleep is what is required. Yeah. I just wanted to pop in Beth with another idea, which is a lot of us, myself included, my breakup date with my family is December 18th. Mm. And so for a lot of us, not only are we dealing with the cultural pressure and the old expectations that may still be inside of us, but we have an anniversary mm. of real deep wounding. And so I'm just putting that out there that maybe this is the time for you to visit that one more time yeah, and go in and do all of the things that Beth was just describing. Um, because that anniversary can be a day of great loss and yeah. it is it is a day of great loss everything yeah. you thought you knew changed that day yeah. it also is a day of freedom and so both can be true at the same time and i would encourage you to just sit in there and understand where you're at now yeah past those initial feelings yeah 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 so that's we just wanted to make that space for you and and uh, there may be a later episode a, a little more on like when do you know it's time to go no contact when do you know like because those are confusing kind of questions but to get back to the topic at hand let's 
let's imagine, and we're going to speak in generalities. We don't know if these people are coming to your house. We don't know if you're going to their house. We don't know. We don't know. And like, maybe today is not the day to talk about and like you being around your in-laws dysfunction or your partner's family's dysfunction some other time. But for today, if we've got about like, you know, 18 minutes or so left. Um, so you've decided to go home. Um, and I will, I will kick us off by saying, if you've never had the experience of reverting to a younger version of yourself around someone who pushes your buttons, mm. you may not be human. <laughs> like I was having a conversation with someone who I love, who I love, and I am an adult and they are an adult. And I turned into like an eight-year-old and that makes them 13. And the five-year gap between eight and 13 is developmentally massive. So I'm like frozen, afraid, feeling totally overpowered. But the reality is in present day, um, they want to heal a relationship with me. So I and them, like I had to keep reminding myself, like I'm an adult, I have communication skills. I'm gonna trust that this person is asking me how I feel because they wanna know, but it's not always like that. But what I wanna remind you or what I, where I want to start is when you were little, you were trapped. What were you going to like pack a bindle and leave, go get a job, get on a train? No. But when you are an adult, you just, sometimes it's about like the proprioceptor sense, which is something that Tabitha talked about in a very earlier, a much earlier episode. Where are the doors and can I walk out of them? Right. I sometimes joke in my fourth floor office that like there are two exits. The best option is the door, but the second best option is the window, right? But how do you get out? You can leave. Whereas when you were little, that freezing or sinking into shame and becoming paralyzed, you don't have to spend this time that way. What do you think? I think that you are dead on with what you're saying and that it is very hard to sort that out internally. Yeah. So if you are struggling, even with what the heck we're talking about, you're mm -hmm. okay. You're okay. Because part of the unpacking of CPTSD is learning what is an accurate representation of who you are, your role, your choice level, your power, and what is not. And yeah. that trapped experience that you were just talking about is so it feels disempowering. It's so arresting. Yeah, it sure is. And as an adult, we can trip right back into that total body experience of being frozen, like you were saying, or for me, I get frenetic. Mm. Like I don't know what's going on or what to do when I'm in that responsive or reactive state. Yeah. So I would really encourage again, our audience to listen to that smallest voice, or whichever one is clearest for you because that's the part of you that is trying to tell you about their safety level, about their comfort level, about their needs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so for those of you who are um, at a place where you're ready to try some new things, um, going home for the holidays is like, oh boy, this is like this rife, uh, practice ground where like, you're going to get an opportunity to, uh, they say in like, you know, Al-Anon literature, uh, sometimes it's like, how do you deal with like the alcoholic or the dysfunctional person in your life? And the literature says, just try anything differently. It's not about whether or not it goes well. It's just that you're trying anything differently. Maybe this is just going to be like an imaginal exercise for you, uh, versus like something you're ready to try or maybe you're ready to try it. It depends. There's nothing like a seems like question when someone is being dishonest and passive aggressive. And mm. here's what I mean. So if someone is like, well, you know, you'd know a lot more about your nephew if you were ever around and you could go, it seems like you're really trying to make me feel bad about not visiting more often. Do I have that right? Or did I misunderstand something? And then people who are passive aggressive, usually 
passive aggressive, not like outwardly aggressive, let's be clear, but people who love to just like slide those digs in, if you go, well, it seems a lot like what you're trying to do right now is um, make me feel guilty. Have I got that right? And then that person either gets the opportunity to go, yeah, I'm mad. And then you could actually have an honest conversation or they go, no, 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 no. It's really amazing to watch people retreat when all of a sudden you show up grounded and honest because mm-hmm. they just don't know what to do. The pattern has been broken. So what would you do, Beth, if somebody doubled down? Double down as in like, which way? Didn't, uh, meaning like um, still passive aggressively, they'll deny. Yeah. And then come back in with another attack. Just a little bit later, would you continue to seems like that process through? No, no, if you can sense, right? So if you, it's interesting, if someone is like trying to meet you, you can go, yeah, I actually do kind of feel guilty that I don't get to see you guys as often. Like there's this window for honest dialogue, but if somebody's doubling down and like pretending like they don't know what you're talking about and they're just like continuing to dig at you, it's a great time to walk away. Because that's Mm -hmm. also doing something different, right? So you could go, oh, I'm actually going to go, I don't know, like smoke weed on a walk. Like, don't tell your uncle that. But like, you could just be like, oh, I actually um, am going to go in. Like, however you need to exit that circumstance, you can do it politely. Or you can look at somebody and go, I think I need to walk away right now. I'll be back in a little bit. Because that's really honest, too. So yeah, I'm so glad you asked that question. What happens if somebody doubles down? you can go, okay, well then now it's time to, to walk away. I had a colleague who worked in child protective services and she had to do home visits a lot. And that included running into some really angry, uh, pretty upset parents. Mm -hmm. So she'd knock at the door and she would essentially be getting like aggressive or passive aggressive, like, like intro changes. And that's who taught me about the seems like she's, she'd go, it seems like you're really trying to make me feel scared. So I don't want to come into this house. And then that, that person either had the opportunity to go, well, yeah, that is what I'm trying to do. And they could have a dialogue or they could go, no, that's not what I'm trying to do. And they let her in or, you know, what you're saying, they could double down and be like, I don't know what you're talking about as they continue to go kind of up and up. And she would essentially say at that point, okay, well then I'm not going to come in for my visit today. I'm just going to have to document the fact that she wouldn't let me in. Mm. That, that's it. You know? And so then she would walk away. The ultimate end to that is you, oh gosh, you make such a great like point though. You don't have to convince anybody of anything. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Oh, the one other thing I would add to this theme that we're talking about right now is if you're in observer mode, I bet you're going to notice some patterns that are going on, not just between you and the other people, but between the other people too, because families that operate like this have roles and they're pretty rigid. Sometimes, sometimes there's flexibility, but pretty much once you're the scapegoat kid, you're always the scapegoat kid. It can shift. So if you have had an experience where that moves, then you've had more than probably two kids in your family and it, it got to be dispersed. The point I'm getting to here is look for blame. Who's blaming who for what? Because blame is one of the ways we shift responsibility out of relationships and keep things the same. So for example, seems like, and the other person would be like, why do you always do that? Why do you always have to point out everybody's flaws and then start attacking? So just pay attention. And that would be, for me, that would be a walk away moment. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, if someone's like, you always do this or like taking sort of assassinating your character. Um, As you were talking, something else occurred to me. Uh, Tyann Dayton wrote this really beautiful book called Emotional Sobriety. And she talks about what is like the neurological consequences of growing up in family dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And in one of her case examples, she talks about this woman having gone home. I don't know if it was for a holiday or what. And she watches her mother yell, like shout very sharply at her, um, at her niece. And it was just so painful to kind of watch the whole thing and know that that had been her, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. But what she did is she looked at her mom and was like, she had to like steal herself up and get herself ready. And she was like, mom, why did you just shout at your grandkid? And the mom looked at her and did kind of exactly what Tab was talking about and was like, you know, you have always been so sensitive. You was, you have always been too sensitive. I didn't even raise my voice. 
And this woman, it was actually, instead of letting it sort of sink her into this like despair and mistrust, she was like, this is what my mother has always said to me, no wonder I mistrust myself. So you can even take something that someone is kind of saying that's really painful for you and go, this is validating to the reality that this is what I grew up like. But Absolutely. In that, I'll also add, and this is where things can get really, really painful. You may watch these patterns of dysfunction get enacted on kids in your family, uh, nephews, nieces, grandkids, um, you know, your gender non-conforming little family members. I don't know if they want to be nephews or nieces or what, but ultimately it's going to hurt. It is going to feel really bad for you to observe that happening. Observe that. That's right. Yeah. Because now we've got this on multiple levels where you're having this realization that was probably very similar to my experience or mine was worse because things like this actually can improve with age a little bit. Like people learn how to tamp it down. Less aggressive, less like less hot with that energy. Yeah. 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 So, so then what would you do for that other partner of your family? I mean, I've had this exact experience with my nephew and what you do when you see that happening is treat that child the way you could have really used some love and treatment, right? So when they're having a meltdown because they just got busted, you can come in and let them know that you see them, you understand how they're feeling and you care about it. Well, you know, here's, I, it's so painful. You know, I think that This is where you can really let yourself kind of break apart in grief, not fall apart, which is to say like, you're going to cry for the rest of the, you know, hours and hours that you're, you're there. But like, uh, Pema Chodron, the Buddhist nun in one of her audio books talks about like the Buddhist symbol or image for compassion is a mother with no arms whose child has just fallen in the river. Compassion isn't about rescuing. It's about looking at the pain of the situation and feeling that it makes you so sad and that you wish you could do something. And you frankly can't, those kids are going to go back with their, their parents. Those kids are going to go like, you are not in control of whether or not your siblings parent their children, however, they're going to parent them. However, in that moment, you know, so like feeling compassion is an action. It is an action. But, you know, looking at a kid and going like, if you ever want to talk to me, I'm around or looking like you may be the one grown up. If you feel resourced for this, if you don't, that's okay too. Cause again, like you are not who brought these kids into this world or like, right. if they are your kids, you can be like, don't talk to my children that way. Like that's actually quite all right. And that can be the reason that you're like, we can try again next year, but we're done here. Right. That's right. So if they are your children, it is your job to protect them. And so how, how well, or how unwell you do that at well, meaning how well you are practiced in that remains to be seen. Mm-hmm. But even if you get in the car on the way home and you say to your kid, I froze when it was time to stand up to grandma and I'm really sorry, I'm working on that, that repair or just validating that that actually happened, that there was something that happened there instead of pretending with everybody else that they just don't know what anybody else is talking about. And I think that validating and mirroring is actually pretty significant because you're saying, you're like showing to someone, this is real. What you're experiencing is real instead of that, like super mind warping. Uh, this is fine. Everybody's fine. Yeah. I right. And this is how, it's just how it is. Right. Yep. Yeah. You're absolutely right that 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 repair and that mirroring, if you've made a mistake in protecting your own children is crucial. And I'm going to postulate and put out there that it will also be healing for your inner child. Mm. Because if you can't, if you are watching yourself do the opposite or the other than what you experience, that in itself is healing. Please, I just want to clarify what I was saying that I'm not suggesting you get in the middle of some grand argument with anybody and other nieces or nephews or other family members at all. But it is appropriate for you to empathize with that, understand what it's like. And if they need a hug, give them one. You don't have to make a family mess. Yeah. Yeah. Love. Yeah. Right. And and please don't because it won't get better for those kids either. Yeah. If you stir everything up, everything gets stirred up. Right. 
Right. Well, and, you know, there's the other, it, it makes me think also, and this is like, if you are at a place where you are um, kind of ready for this, so don't try to force yourself here if you're not ready for it. Mm -hmm. uh, in a, in a similar, it might even be the same audiobook that uh, Pema Chodron talks about uh, this woman who went home and she got into the same kind of conflict that she always got into with her, with her siblings. And then she was sitting in her room and all of a sudden the thought struck her, I have tools and this is how hard this feels for me. It must feel this hard or much harder for everybody else in this system too. And she was actually struck with how sad that was that mm -hmm. it moved her to tears and just like opened up that heart of compassion. And then she like in her letter to Pema Chodron continues and says, and that actually helped me be a lot more compassionate and less defensive for the rest of the trip. It's not the same thing as not having boundaries. So that when right. someone's like, drive me, you know, 30 miles to Mississippi to buy some Adderall that you're like, yeah, I'm so compassionate. I'll do it. That's not what we're getting at. But like that you could look at the tenderness of this situation and know that your siblings are only parenting their children with the skill set that they got from your parents. And that's them doing the very best that they can. And like, it can really, it really breaks your heart. It is heartbreaking. Yeah. It's also just to come right back in. It's also not your sole responsibility to fix that. That's right. And part of compassion is like the armless mother you were just talking about. Part oh, of cool. compassion is allowing yourself to observe and feel the situation and not take action. Yeah. Externally, at least. It's so, hard. so I'm, I'm thinking that one of the things that might be helpful for people to know about is that sometimes with CPTSD, we have um, what's known as thinking errors. And it's just where our thinking goes sideways a little bit. Mm -hmm. And one of those thinking errors, for example, would be all or nothing thinking. Right. And so I'm coming back in with that all or nothing thinking idea. We've agreed to stay at mom's house. We've got to stay at mom's house. That's not necessarily true. And so I would really encourage you to consider if you need to change your plans immediately, what are you going to do? Have your backup plans ready. Yeah. Yeah. Have them ready. And if that means if this happens one time, I am going to go buy a ticket and leave uh, for the right. Or if this happens, if I'm starting to feel pressure, I'm going to say it would say it would be better for me to go to a hotel. There are a lot of ways you can have backup plans, including the weed walk. That that's what's talking about a little earlier. Yeah. Have those ready before you go. <laughs> the weed walk. I love that. Um, your, your, um, what's another one? Your, uh, I don't know. I'm trying to like be, do alliteration and nothing clever is coming up. Um, Here's, here's what you uh, were like coming up on our time, you and I, Tabitha. And one of the things that we want to, I want to really convey to you is there's nothing final about any of, um, of these circumstances, situations, or decisions. You know, the, the big thing is like, everything's impermanent. Mm -hmm. um, this, this will pass, this too shall pass. And, you know, back to that question before, which is, has you going home ever actually made anybody who is alleging that that's going to make them happy? Has it ever really given them lasting happiness? Or is mm. this just another one of those places where it's like kind of what Tabitha was talking about? This extra responsibility is getting put on you when really you are not powerful enough to make anyone in your family happy, unhappy, healthy, unhealthy. You just can't do it. And so if, um, if the winter is about, you know, seasonally, depending on where you're, you're listening to this podcast, if cold weather months are about resting, taking stock, being still, it is not the time period that things are growing. It's when everything is like hibernating. That's me in the wintertime catch me acting like a bear besides like, I want to get fat. I want to sleep a bunch. I don't want to get pregnant, which is what bears are trying to do. Right. Let me get pregnant and then go hibernate. That's not my, that's not it. But this idea that like, you can kind of tap into your own more natural rhythms and let that inform what you want to do. Um, I, I keep coming back to this, but you know, Ani Pema Chodron, that's my, that's my home girl. Um, she talks about like, maybe you go home for one day. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
oh, thanks a lot. But for that 24 hours, which is actually your like date of expiry for this visit, you have a pretty good visit. And then everybody leaves with just like a little bit more of like good feelings and warmth towards each other. And maybe three years from now, you go spend 48 hours there. When people, when my clients tell me things like I'll be spending 14 days at home because my mother is who bought the ticket and she's the one who picked the like the and return dates. And I'm like, ah, oh, 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 two weeks. Oh boy. <laughs> I'd be buying myself a ticket right in the middle of that time. <laughs> uh -huh. And, and let, me, let me also make, um, I'm, let, these are going to be my like closing statements, a message of hope. This may not be your circumstance, but it may be. Um, in 2018, I went home with the intention of having a clarifying conversation with my mother. And she and I, we're sitting doing something and I was like, let, we need to talk. And I was like, if we want to have a relationship moving forward, I need you to know that I know that you were abusive. And she was like, oh, I definitely was. I know mm. I did that. And I have been in my own way trying to tell you how sorry I am for like your whole life. Um, I was terrified. Mm -hmm. I, I boarded my animal in order to be able to have that exit strategy. I was even like sitting by the door. Because this part of me that was like, this is not going to go well. You're going to need to exit. What I didn't expect was her to go, I'm ready to be responsible. Mm -hmm. some, some of these caregivers are going to dig in like what Tabitha is talking about. They're going to double down. They're going to dig in because they didn't come in this lifetime to do that kind of healing. But they're not all like that. So you get to try and that's the measure of success, not how they receive it. I want to Absolutely. always bring it back to that. How they receive it is not whether or not it was successful. It was that you tried to do anything different. What are your final thoughts, Tab? My final thoughts are also a message of hope, but from the opposite perspective. Yeah. Because I had a very hard conversation with my family, my dad and my mom in particular, and at the where I literally said, I really wish we could work this out. Yeah. And by the end of that conversation, I was being blamed for literally everything that had mm. ever gone wrong with me, mm. my brother, my parent. I mean, it was ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm grateful for that because the closing comments for my dad were so ridiculous. I couldn't take responsibility. It set for you it free. Like, that's right. It was so nuts that it set you free. Yes. That's right. And so there's hope there too. And yes. both these paths are painful. Yes. But it's not as much suffering as what you're doing now. It's scary as heck. Yeah. There's lots of help. So be hopeful yeah. that your opinion matters. You can handle this because you've already gained some skills and you know how to find support. Totally. Totally. Mm -hmm. Um, and with that, you know, uh, we wish you all like a safe, warm, loving, healing end of the year. Uh, perfect timing. We, we did our very first CPTSD podcast on January 1, 2022. And here we are uh, wrapping up towards the end of the year. Um, and I just want, you know, I want anybody out there listening Stop and think about what are the major milestones for you in this past year? What have mm -hmm. you done that you're proud of? What are things that make you feel deep gratitude? Um, not the kind of like anxious anticipation of how am I going to handle what's coming? But like in this moment, if I'm looking back and reflecting, what do I have to be proud of in my own health and healing journey? Absolutely. And as you were saying, in our Northern Hemisphere, cold weather, it's the perfect time to be doing that. I would encourage you to do exactly what Beth just said and also pay attention to what has changed in my body. Yeah. Am I less pained in different spots? Am I more aware of my senses? Yeah. Tune in to that progress you've made associating instead of dissociating. Yeah, I like that. That's really sweet. Um, I am excited and interested to see where the CPTSD podcast is going to go. Uh, you guys are in extremely competent and capable hands in those of Tabitha Bird Weaver. Um, and with that, we will wish you a very happy season finale, both in 2022 and to season two of the CPTSD podcast. Thank you, Beth. And goodbye, everybody. Bye, guys. <laughs>